And I've been asked to speak on this key subject here, raising the dead. Can the dead be raised? And I've just written down my answer here, and it's going to be yes. The dead can be raised. Jesus was raised, and you can be too. And other dead people are also sometimes raised. So there you go. That's the kind of short answer. And um, I'm going to give you a slightly longer one as well. But kind of the short answer that I want you to take away from, from this, from this big question, can the dead be raised? Yes. Jesus has been raised, and you could be raised from the dead too. That's the kind of key issue that I want you to take away. So if you forget everything else, that's fine, but remember that. That's what I'd love you to take away. The passage that I've been asked to speak on comes from 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. And um, it's a few verses, and it says this. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death, where is your victory? But thanks be to God, the victory comes through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm called Frog for a whole number of reasons. My mum um, isn't given to flattery. And so she decided when I was about three months old that she thought that I looked like a weird African fish called a guppy when I was feeding. And it's a kind of frog-faced kind of um, fish. And um, so she called me Froglet. By the time I got to about 10, I decided that I was far too grown up to have a name like Froglet. And as we all know, frogs metamorphose. I was very good at understanding that from a tad tadpole through to a froglet and then the full mature version, frog. So the reason I'm called frog is because I'm mature and I used to be called froglet. My um, grandmother, my parents were also hoping that at one stage I would kind of grow up and get rid of that, maybe when I got married or um, perhaps became a vicar in the Church of England. They thought surely that is the time when he will drop that name. But I haven't, so here I am. And um, I hope that what I have to say to you will stay with you today and will stay with you during the course of this week. This Sunday, the marathon has been pounding up and down. In fact, my sister is number 11721. And she came past twice, along with many other people as well, including a mum from the school gate back in the sellout of suburbia, where I come from. So outside this church this week, there have been sprinters and stragglers you can't watch it without thinking of those kind of natural things. Is life a marathon? I'm not going to be too cheesy on that tonight. But life has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. We run it with others, not necessarily 37,500 runners. Some seem to speed past, some stumble and fall, some stop to vomit, others to wee on the side of the road. Some seem to be in fancy dress. Many run the race with a loved one in mind, raising money for charity. Some run it for good causes, some to help others, some just run to win. More training and preparation makes for a better race and better results. Running the marathon at the end of the race is exhaustion. I hope this evening's service might be similar for you. As you tumble into church like a reviving hot bath at the end of the marathon of life, have a little hug and a towel down. That is what we are here to give you, a sense of support. No, but honestly, one of the things that's interesting about a marathon is that there is a winner. There is a winner in a marathon. And this little verse from Corinthians is taken from a, a much older verse of the scriptures. There seems to toy up. There are two options in life. Somebody is going to win. Something is going to win. Is life going to win or is death going to win? Who's going to get the victory in life? Is it going to be life or death? This morning, the Sun newspaper ran a lengthy story from the mouth of the footballer Fabrice Mwamba. The 23-year-old collapsed on the pitch. After 78 minutes without a beating heart, he was revived again. It was remarkable, amazing, wonderful, fantastic. Some are calling him the miracle man. Many in the nation prayed for his recovery. Some fine doctors and paramedics worked brilliantly, and the hospitals as well. Some of his doctors said he was, in effect, dead, but now he is, in effect, alive again. Six years ago, when I was a vicar in Peckham, a, a guy called Patrick was stabbed on commercial way through the heart in a contract killing. The police visited me with his mother later on that day as she was on her way to our weekly prayer meeting to say that though he was alive, they let me know 
that she had a kind of faith that she thought that he was going to pull through, but they didn't give him more than an hour or two. We gathered in the church to pray with some faithful Caribbean grannies, and we cried out to God for his life. He revived, and he lived for another year and a half, and finally succumbed to some of the complications from that stabbing, after which I performed the funeral. It was one of those great funerals where the full of the back two rows were people in trench coats and dark glasses. I asked for a slight police escort for that funeral. In this final year, though, he restored his relationship with his family, and he was able to die in peace. Now, whether Mwamba and Patrick are miracles, whether they were a convergence of extraordinary events from amazing medical staff or something of a combination of the two, those people did eventually die again. Throughout the Gospels, there are many, many accounts of Jesus praying for people who were dead and they were raised from the dead in a supernatural way. There was the son of a widow from a town called Nain. There was a daughter of a man called Jairus. There was a man called Lazarus, who was one of his best friends, who was raised from the dead after three days in a tomb in the Middle East where it stank. But like Patrick from Peckham, like Mwamba, perhaps, and Like many of those people, eventually their heart will stop beating. And will it be that death has got the final victory? There was a famous phrase, we think that it was started by Benjamin Franklin, that there are only two certain things in life. Can everybody know what they are? Death and taxes. In fact, he wrote it in a new letter. In a letter, I did a bit of research on this. Our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can said to be certain except death and taxes in a letter to Jean-Baptiste Leroy in 1789. So who is going to get the victory in your life? Is it the certainty of death? Is the end of the beating of your heart, the stopping of your brain function and the collapse of your central nervous system and the stopping of your breath, is that the end? Has death got the victory? Or is this Old Testament passage right? Thanks be to God, Jesus Christ has triumphed over death. Death in itself has been defeated. Now we do quite a lot in our life to try to escape physical death. And um, a story is told of a middle-aged lady who had a heart attack. She was taken to the hospital and when she was on the operating table, she had an extraordinary near-death experience. Seeing God, she looked up and she asked, is my time up? God said, no. You have another 43 years, two months and eight days to live. Upon recovery, the woman decided to stay in the hospital and make the best of the years to come, having a facelift, liposuction, and a tummy tuck. She even had somebody come in, change her hair colour, boob job, and the whole works. And since she had so much more time to live, she figured she might as well make the most of it. After her last operation, she was finally released from hospital. Now, while crossing the street on her way back home, she was killed by an ambulance in the bay outside A&E. Arriving in front of God, she demanded, I thought you said that I had another 40 years. Why didn't you pull me out of the path of that incoming ambulance? And God replied, I'm terribly sorry. I did not recognise you. (laughs) What we think about death, whether we're trying to cheat death, how we view death has an enormous impact upon our lives. And I want to understand death and being raised from the dead in two kinds of ways. One is to see death as the purely physical end of our lives. And the other is to recognise that people can be affected by the fear of death, by their understanding of death, and can also live a kind of mental or spiritual or social death. Death has many tentacles that, that has an effect upon our life. And in trying to answer that important question, can the dead be raised, I want to see a faith that is able to revive the bones, but also the heart. What about the soul death? What about the death of the mind and the emotions? What about the psychological death and depression that grips so many of us? Can those dead be raised as well as the physical dead be raised as well? The Christian claim is that a man was born in history who lived. It was attested by pagan and Roman and Jewish and Christian ancient sources that Jesus Christ was such a man. Peter had seen him feed 5,000 people, walk on water, heal a deaf man, raise a paralytic up to walk, and forgive sins. Jesus is no ordinary man. 
He claims to be God and man together. The Christ, the anointed one. The long expected person who was prophesied through hundreds of years of history. The one who is to be a saviour and a king to bring people into a relationship with God. Every Christian today and every church building even is based on a foundational event and a foundational idea. That the man of history died and on the third day was raised again from the dead in a physical way. And that that turned history on its hinge. This very building here, built in the 1650s where Captain Cook and others worshipped, only makes sense if underneath it there isn't just the foundations of a crypt, but the foundations of an event, an idea, and a resurrected human who was also God. Christianity does not make any sense. It is a naive delusion if this is not true. It is a nice idea, but eventually a delusional one. Christian faith has always said it's on this event that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, but also that that has implications for us today. That Jesus remains having this power over death. As the scripture we read says, thanks be to God, he gives us the victory in that alternative. Who is going to win and have the victory in the marathon of life? Will it be death or will it be life through Jesus Christ? Now there will come a time for you and I when our heart will stop beating will happen for all of us. For some of us, death will come at the end of a long struggle. Some of us, it will be like it is relief at the end of a long terminal illness. Sometimes it feels like sickness or tragedy or accident or violence has cut the people that we love off in the prime of their life. But physical death, however certain like taxes, is not the end of the road. And despite this, many of us live in fear of it. It will affect our decision making. It will affect our relationships. Nick Hornby wrote this. I saw for the first time how scared I was of dying and of other people dying and of how this fear has prevented me from doing all sorts of things like giving up smoking. Because if you take death too seriously or not seriously enough as I've been doing up till now, then what's the point? It stopped me thinking about my life and especially my job in a way that contains the future. That is too scary because future will end in death. But most of all, it has prevented me from sticking with a relationship. And your life becomes dependent on that person's life and then they die as they're bound to do unless there are exceptional circumstances, e.g. they are a character from a science fiction novel. Well, if that happens and they die first, then you're up the creek without a paddle, aren't you? It's okay if I die first, I guess, but having to die before somebody else isn't isn't a necessity that cheers me up very much. How do I know when she's going to die? Could be run over by a bus tomorrow. In which case, should I throw myself under a bus today? How I think about death and how I think about the future affects my decision making and my relationships today. It also affects my psychology Two psychologists wrote this. As a further point of clarification, Dr. Minerth and I are convinced that many people choose happiness but do not obtain it. The reason for this is that though they choose to be happy, they seek for inner peace and joy in all the wrong places. They seek for happiness and materialism, but they do not find it. They seek for joy in sexual prowess, but end up with fleeting pleasures and long-term disappointments. They seek for inner fulfillment by seeking positions of power in corporations, in governments, and even in families, but they remain unfulfilled. I've had millionaire businessmen come into my offices, tell me they have big houses, yachts in the Mediterranean condominiums, nice children, a beautiful mistress, an unsuspecting wife, secure corporate positions, and yet they have suicidal tendencies. They have everything that this world has to offer except one thing, inner peace and joy. They come to my office as a last resort, begging me to help them conquer the urge to kill themselves. Jesus' death and resurrection is designed and exists to open up a door to life and life in all of its fullness. A certain door that when opened will lead to the inner peace and joy. Psychological death comes from looking fulfilment in the peripheries, not in that central truth as Seth was talking about. If we seek for life in the peripheries, we will not find that victory over death in all of its forces, whether it be physical death or psychological death as well. But here is what we know. That Jesus 
after several announcements that he would rise from the dead on the third day, was crucified and died. This is the same Jesus who at several points had raised people from the dead as part of his healing ministry. We know for definite that he died and was buried, was seen by witnesses from all walks of life, and the event was written about by eyewitnesses from many different um, sceptical Jewish as well as other sources. We know that he was stabbed through his side. We know he was laid in a tomb and wrapped in linen, ready for burial. We know he was crucified, and this happened on a Friday at about noon. On Sunday morning, several witnesses went over to the tomb. First, a group of ladies coming to pay their respects, and other disciples found the immense stone rolled away, soldiers fleeing, and the grave clothes folded inside the tomb. On that very first day, Mary and the other disciples, then Thomas, then the twelve, then 500 people all at once, had encounters with this risen Lord Jesus, as he said that they would. No hallucination. He ate, he drank, he even cooked breakfast, for goodness sake, and it was haddock. He ate and he drank, and he talked, and he even cooked for them. He taught, he performed miracles, he restored relationships, all after his resurrection from the dead. There hasn't been a moment since that first Easter morning where Jesus has not been worshipped and known and active within the world. There has been a church ever since. The physical resurrection of Jesus Christ was not just something that happened to one person. It fundamentally adjusts and adapts the way we perceive death itself and prepare our life for a life after death. It even takes away death's final victory. The resurrection takes away the victory of death. It kills death. A poem by a poet called Steve Turner, who is a great inspiration to you 2 and Bono, is called The Morning That Death Was Killed. And it's spoken from a kind of imagined uh, scenario. I woke in a place that was dark. The air was spicy and still. I was bandaged from head to foot the morning that death was killed. I rose from a mattress of stone. I folded my clothes on the sill. I heard the door rolling open the morning that death was killed. I walked alone in the garden. The birds in the, gar- in the branches trilled. It felt like a new beginning the morning that death was killed. Mary, she came there to find me. Peter, with wonder, was filled. And John came running and jumping the day that death was killed. My friends were lost in amazement. My father, I knew, was thrilled. Things were never again the day that death was killed. The dead are raised, but what are the implications for it? It allows us to look at suffering and at the end in a very different way. They say that the early martyrs that were burnt at the stake in the Colosseum or fed to lions, often went singing hymns. I've got three sons, a six-year-old twins and a three-year-old called Benjamin. Now, one of my twins has got a middle name, which is Festo. Now, I have a double-barreled surname, which is a little bit of a mouthful, but I decided to give my children an even more unfortunate scenario of having even more middle names than I do. So, he's called Zachary Samuel Festo, or Ewing, and the other one's called Elijah Freddie Boniface or Ewing. And the other one is called Benjamin Archibald Ambrose John or Ewing. I thought that three kids was the only amount that I was going to have. And I liked all of those names. I think I just bundled them all in together. Now, Zachary's middle name is Festo. Festo means rejoicing or joyful or happy. But it's really named after a Ugandan man alive in the 1970s called Festo Kavengri, who was a bishop in the Rwanda-Uganda border. He ministered in Uganda in the time of the murderous regime of Idi Amin, who was the dictator in the 1970s. This is the story that he tells. Bishop Festo Kavengri had met with Idi Amin to voice his opposition to the killing in 1973 of three men from his diocese by a government firing squad on a trumped-up charge. The quote goes, February the 10th began as a sad day for us in Kabali. People were commanded to come to the stadium and witness the execution. Death permeated the atmosphere. A silent crowd of about 3,000 were ready to watch. I had permission from the authorities to speak to the men before they died. And two of my fellow ministers were with me. They brought the men in a truck and they unloaded them. They had them handcuffed and their feet were chained. The firing squad stood to attention. As we walked into the centre of the stadium, I was wondering what to say. How do you give the gospel to doomed men who are probably seething with rage? 
We approached them from behind, and as they turned round to look at us, what a sight. Their faces were alight with an unmistakable glow and radiance. Before we could say any of thing, one of them burst out, Bishop, thank you for coming. I wanted to tell you, the day that I was arrested in my prison cell, I asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart. He came in and he forgave me all of my sins. Heaven is now open and there is nothing between me and my God. Please tell my wife and my children that I'm going to be with Jesus. Ask them to accept him into their lives just as I did. The two other men told similar stories, excitedly raising their hands and rattling their handcuffs in praise. I felt that what I needed to do was talk to the soldiers and not to the condemned. So I translated what the men had said into a language which the soldiers understood. The military men were standing there with guns cocked and bewilderment on their faces. They were so dumbfounded they forgot to put the hoods, the hoods over the men's faces. The three men faced the firing squad standing close together. They looked towards the people. They began to wave in happiness, handcuffs and all. The people waved back. The shots were fired. And the three men were with Jesus. This is what is meant. Death, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? But God has given us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death does not win the marathon of life. God has entrusted the solution to life and death itself into the hands of his one and only son. And that entrustment takes you and I and gives us the opportunity of gathering our lives and our marathon of life into his death on the cross and on the third day his rising from the grave proves and secures a future for you and I if we accept it where death does not get the final say. That is what Christianity is about. The dead can be raised. Jesus has been raised and you too can have an eternal life. What do you get to do about it? Well, like those men in the story with Festo Cavengri, they recognised that all they needed to do was accept what Christ had already done for them. They needed to say very simply, sorry, thank you, and please. They needed to say sorry for all that they'd done wrong in their life up until that moment. They needed to thank God for his intervention, his love, his offering of himself, his defeating of death, and they needed to say, please come into my life. Please become the central plank of my being and my existence. When each and every one of us is in right relationship with God, death no longer gets the final victory. Sorry, thank you, and please. Now there are some of us who've already prayed a prayer like that and what can we do with it? Well it may be that we are still living with the sting of death affecting us that fear of death hanging over our heads affecting our relationships our planning and our future allowing us to live in fear and in caution when we need to be full of adventure Adventure, an adventurous life is moulded in our understanding that what we die for can be more important than what we live for are we willing to lay down our life for a cause and a God more noble and more wonderful than ourselves? To count our own lives as less important than the triumph of love within our universe and the transformation of our communities and the unsettling of evil and domination where it is? What is going to be more important to us? And so I think there are two implications those of us who've already asked the Lord Jesus into our life, have we become gripped by fear and the fear of death? Do we need to be released from it? And secondly, there may be some of us here who need to pray the prayer that those people in Kabali once prayed for themselves, a sorry, a thank you, and a please. I don't want to be under the sting of death anymore. Death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? But thanks be to God. The dead can be raised, Jesus is raised, and I can be raised too. One of you able to close your eyes now.